be very nice to see you all. Um, I hope you can understand my accent. I, I originate from a place called Southampton uh, in southern England. And Chilmu, what, what's really important, despite everything that you've uh, read out about my career, the most important thing is I'm a crazy soccer fan. So if any of you like football or what they call soccer in the United States, then, then we'll get on. <laughs> that, that, that's my passion. Um, but no, if I just a very, very brief introduction. And, and I think what I'll do, Chilmu, I'll probably stop at various stages rather than just give the long presentation. We can stop every 15, 20 minutes have some questions, yeah. and we'll just make, make it a little bit more informal, uh, sure. which would be good. good. Um, but this is me. I come from the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, which is in Orlando, Florida. Um, Orlando is famous, hopefully, the world over because it's the home of Disney. Um, so in the United States, pre-COVID, we were attracting 75 million visitors per year 75 million it's huge million. it's huge and although disney has properties in california and other parts of the world the vast majority of its money is made in florida so this is really the cash cow uh, of the disney empire and also we have universal studios at sea world and but anything related to theme parks water parks we, we we are the home of that and in fact literally just around the corner from the, co the college uh, universal studios are constructing a five billion dollar new theme park which opens in 2025 so it, it's certainly uh, not dull and something that we're very proud of if you just see on the screen we're ranked number one. You'll probably be aware of the Shanghai rankings, which is primarily a research ranking. And we're number one in the United States. So we're, we're very, very proud of that. And uh, it's something that I'll dis discuss uh, as we go through. Just, just very, very quickly, I'm sure you're probably familiar with these uh, already. And my, my good colleague, Dr. Fevzi, he, he will be very happy that I'm showing this slide. Um, we're the home of four leading uh, research journals. So we're the editorial home. So myself and my Dean Yu Cheng Wong are the editors of Destination Marketing Management, which Chulma, you kindly said, has got a very strong impact factor now. My colleague, Dr. Ockermus, is the editor of the International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management, which is very popular with uh, South Korean uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. He also does hospitality and tourism insights. And then my good friend, uh, Dr. Rivera, he's the editor of uh, the Journal of Hospitality Management. So we're, we're very much a, um, a real pillar of the sort of publishing uh, establishment in the United States mm -hmm. uh, and beyond. Very, very important that it's a theme that will come all the way through. We have around 70 faculty, but we're from 18 different countries. So um we have faculty from south korea from turkey from south africa from china from ukraine united kingdom uh nigeria you you name it we've got representation and that's been a very deliberate recruitment strategy because the bulk of tourism is international so we've had a very deliberate uh, strategy of international recruitment for a number of years now and it just makes your research networks stronger because we all come with a slightly different view i did i, I studied in the united kingdom i have a british phd which is very very different for from the united states phd but it gives variety so we we we, we, we have good fun i think underpinning um Basically, everything I'm going to say today is really based on, it's based on my academic work, but it's based on my sort of project work as well. And I've been very, very, very lucky over the years. So that, that is me in the pitch. I'm a little bit slimmer there. COVID has made me a little bit fat. <laughs> I'm afraid that that's a slightly better picture. Um, but no, sure. I, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I, I've been very, very lucky. So I've actually conducted projects uh, mainly for regional or national governments in, in all these different countries. So uh, I don't travel as much now, um, but it, it's interesting. I think much of what I'm going to say this evening, it doesn't matter what country or area that you're related to. In many cases, the questions are exactly the same. 
So if you're in South Korea or if you're in Britain or if you the United States, a lot of the questions and the challenges of tourism, they're actually not dissimilar. And I think it, one of the frustrations in many ways is the fact that everybody seems to be challenging with the same issues and problems of how to make tourism better. Um, I'm, I'm normally asked what, it, what is my favorite trip and my least favorite. My favorite is probably South Africa, which is just, a, I don't know if any of you have been to South Africa. It's just a stunningly beautiful country. Oh, it, yeah. it's I'm just, going to go there. Genuinely. Oh, Chulmo, it, it's amazing. Um, I don't think I've had a bad experience. The Probably my, South Africa is my favorite in terms of natural beauty. Um, probably my most amazing experiences have been in India because India is just so crazy. I don't know if you've got any India to, India's a, a crazy place, but it, it's fast, to me it's fascinating. And certainly there's a connection to British history there as well, uh, which, which is good. Um, but as you can see, I've yet, I've yet to be uh, to South Korea, but we, we, we'll get there one day. Um, so just, just to give a sort of general introduction, and as I say, I'll stop every 15, 20 minutes and have a little bit of a chat. Um, I, I'm not gonna read out, in fact, to Chulmu, I can supply the slides to you as a PDF at the end, and then you, you're more than welcome to share, share oh, them with, thank you very much. With, with the students. We, we all know tourism is big, so I, I'm not gonna repeat all the numbers. We know tourism is big, we know the impact is huge, but I think, a lot of the challenges that we have anywhere in tourism is, is primarily because tourism has been so unplanned in so many places. And I always tell my students, everybody, no matter where you are, tourists always get the blame. Tourists don't spend enough money. Um, tourists don't stay long enough. Tourists <laughs> aren't sufficiently sustainable. Um, British tourists drink too much beer. OK, but it's always the fault of the tourist. I've always argued to my students, it's the destination. It's those that design and develop tourism. Ultimately, they're the source of the good, but they're also the source of the bad. If you design tourism in a way that is uh, ineffective, you will then have multiple problems. So it, I guess the sad, I've, I've been doing this for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. I started my academic career in 1992. And I guess the frustration, I'm still meeting politicians now who I think are asking incredibly stupid questions. And they're asking the questions because they don't fully understand what tourism is all about mm. and uh, as i say i can't example south korea at all today i'm afraid but hopefully you can connect with some of the things i'm saying we had a group from the caribbean uh, about 11 caribbean islands we we, we had we visited uh, it was about two weeks ago and one of the complaints from one of the islands was about cruise tourism mm. And the comment was, oh, it's awful. All these people come off the ship. Um, they stay in the destination for about two hours. They buy a cup of coffee and then they get back on the ship again. Mm. I replied, said, what do you expect? If all you provide them is a coffee shop and you don't <laughs> give them any other drink. It, 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 it's incredible how people just expect there to be some magic when in reality, tourism is as complicated as anything else. You, to do it properly, it, it, it really is quite difficult. But I would say, despite the numbers, a lot of the problems out there are due to tourism being unplanned. And I'm just going to move my image on the screen over here. Yeah. And... And I would say one, one of my very good friends, Chulmu, you, you may know Dimitros Buhalis, um, a very good friend of mine from the UK. He's a Greek uh, professor, but he's based in the UK. Dimitros always says there's no such thing as over tourism. And I, I agree with him. I agree with him 500 percent. It's just that there are too many tourists at a certain time, at a certain place that are poorly managed. And I think one of the challenges is it goes back to as a professional do you fully understand the motivations of tourists 
their travel flow, how they behave, how they spend, how they interact and where they go. You know, simple questions, but they're not necessarily easy answers. And the challenge we have is primarily through our friend, I don't know if you can see my uh, Apple iPhone here, Instagram has probably um, magnified these problems a lot more in recent years. With a simple image, all of a sudden makes a place incredibly popular. And no sooner has that place been made popular, people arrive, but the political and the physical infrastructure to support the increasing volume is very slow to materialize. So there's a very there's very much a time lag. It's always been there, but with the technology, it happens much, much quicker now. And it's very, very difficult uh, to hold that back. I would argue in the literature, so we are now 2022. Overtourism was really a theme just before COVID, so probably about four or five years ago. I would argue if you read these books going back to the 1970s, really they were explaining what is now happening uh, today or certainly pre-COVID. So it's not that tourism has changed, the volume has changed, but I would argue anyone who's managing tourism, if they read these books and actually think about them, they'd be far more prepared for what's happening. Um, and it's one of those cases that the academic world doesn't always talk cleanly with the industry, when in reality, they actually have uh, a lot to offer. And this is a little bit old now, but this is something I show to my students as just as an example of really what I'm talking about. So. Um, this is London. This is a political map of London. In fact, actually, a political map of London is on fire at the moment, Chilmo, because they're changing prime minister almost every Tuesday. So it, it's, it's going through a little bit of a crazy spell. Um, <laughs> but this is the political map of London. And this could, this could be uh, Seoul. It could be New York City. It could be Paris. It doesn't really matter. But the colours demonstrate what I'm trying to say. So on one side, you have international spender visitors. Yeah. And on the other side, you have, I think, I, I think so, yeah, it's the day visitor spend. So the day visitor, the red, the greater the red area, the yeah. more tourist expenditure. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you're the mayor of London, if you're responsible for tourism and transportation and events in London, uh -huh. if you're dealing with day visitors, the concentration of tourists is very tight. Uh -huh. If you've right. ever visited London, the, the tourist areas is very close to the river. Uh -huh. But the blue areas, almost no tourism at all, or very, very, very limited. Yes. So understanding the day visitor mark, everybody comes in by train, uh -huh. some by car, not very few, but it's primarily by train, it's by coach. So the concentration of the tourism activity is very, very central to London. Right. If you're an international visitor, the economic spend is far more diverse or it's far more spread out. And it's far more spread out because to the west of London, that's where you have the airports or you, you have London Heathrow, which is the major airport. So yeah. you have the airport infrastructure, you have the hotel infrastructure, you have all the industry that supplies the airport. So it's a huge infrastructure that boosts that economic impact. So if you're managing tourism for international visitors, it's very, very, very different than if you're looking at just domestic spend. Uh -huh. Now, it's a little bit simplistic, but it just demonstrates you're dealing with the same destination, but the benefits or the, the economic activity is uh -huh. it's a very, 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 very different pattern. Okay. And 
part of the theme that we're looking at today is well the economic benefit is fine but uh-huh. actually how does it benefit the well-being of the resident community uh-huh. okay i um, i used to live at mutton ah okay <laughs> so you you know this map very well <laughs> yeah yeah i i i came aware of this map i of course i live in wimbledon uh, oh, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, they, a lot of the international visitors in Wimbledon as well for education. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 you, you're quite right. And I think the, the reason I keep showing these is because people don't necessarily think of... We, 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 we had a meeting relatively recent, and, and again, it was a politician from one of the... Um, uh, Caribbean islands, it was the same meeting actually, and they were unaware of the differences between how a leisure visitor or leisure tourist behaves compared to a business tourist. Mm. And you just go crazy because essentially these are the people making policy for tourism. And it's like tourism 101. Um, but no, just think of yourself if, if you're a politician, you're you have huge responsibility for tourism, for transportation and all the rest of it. But part of the challenge, particularly on the right hand side, all those blue areas don't really have a huge relation to day visitor tourism. Mm. So the economic benefit is very centralized. The okay. challenge for the authorities is how do you actually push out the social, cultural, um, an overall sort of well-being benefit to a great percentage of the population. And this, mm-hmm. this is true in Orlando, it's true in London, it's, it's true anywhere. Um, so this is the thing that we revisit as we go through. But just, just keep the, the red and the blue in mind because the soul will have a very, very similar uh, mm-hmm. dynamic. You have to understand who you're attracting where mm-hmm. people stay and how they move around. Otherwise, you you you, you can't understand tourism. Okay. Good. Of course, we can't have any session without mentioning COVID. So, of course, COVID has been an absolute disaster for um, most most touristic places. Uh, to be fair, and I think one of the over exaggerated impacts of COVID has been the extent to which tourism will fundamentally change once the pandemic has truly passed. And really for the past two years, many, many commentators, very experienced commentators have argued that tourism will fundamentally change. Tourists will come back as better human beings. they will be more receptive to the environment. The reality is tourists are actually coming back mostly like they did before. Hmm. So the extent to which people have really changed their pattern of behavior, yes, there are certain things that have changed, Mm -hmm. but if I can just give an example from uh, my my home city, Orlando. So this year, so uh, Americans work in quarters, everything's the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, I don't know if it's the same in South Korea. But the first quarterly earnings of this year, so January, February, March 2022, Disney, which is Disney employs 80,000 people in the city. So that gives an indication of the scale. They had their second biggest ever uh, revenue earnings in 50 years this January, February, March. Mm. Second, is, uh, second highest earnings in 50 years. It's like, wow. Because of a revenge? And, well, and, and Universal Studios, uh-huh. they had their highest ever revenue take ever. And it's primarily because they're tapping into the pent-up demand. So for, for a long time now, people have not been able to travel or they've certainly not been able to travel to the same extent. And what they've seen is a huge, absolutely huge rush of tourists coming back to what they had before. And obviously think that things aren't cheap. So just think 50 years Disney's been in operation. It's been their second highest earning period ever. 
So it just gives an indication of how quickly, not all, but how many places are going back. And to some extent, what, what we're talking about this evening is COVID-19 actually represents an opportunity for destinations to do things slightly differently. Mm. My concern is the speed that the market's coming back, that opportunity may be lost. So that that that's really um you know the, the challenge we're we're after. And you'll you'll be very familiar. The benefits, net, the positives and negatives, uh, environmental, economic, social, and we're adding health. And the reason I felt let me tell you uh, uh, how I first came interested in this area. So I used to be based in Bournemouth in southern England. Bournemouth. Um, Bournemouth, yeah, so in southern England. So it's very good universities in, in yeah. southern England. And one of the one of the challenges was it's a very, very big touristic town. Mm. But all of a sudden it became quite obvious that although there were many benefits from tourism, mm. there were very high levels of poverty. Mm very high levels of alcoholism, mm. and very high levels of drug abuse. Mm. And there were studies around many similar coastal towns. And it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't just tourism, but part of the challenge tourism has is many people are working very late at night. So you're mm. working very antisocial hours. Oh, I see. When, I see. when you finish late in the evening, you have a drink, you have a cigarette or, or what have you. Okay. And the, there's a there's quite a large human toll on the sort uh -huh. of workforce, uh, not deliberately, but it's a little bit of a knock on effect of the, the hours that people work in. Um, so it, it came to realize that if it's not managed properly, there can actually be some quite significant negative health impacts okay. uh, of tourism. I thought. So, I thought because Bomos has police. It's got sorry. Uh, Dimitri, he uh, he's there in Bomos. Yes, it's not his fault though. Uh, that's why he has problem there. That's why the <laughs> social problem there, the environmental yeah. problem, problem yeah. because yeah. of him. It 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 it's all talk, good. talk a team. Uh, he, he he's he's very talkative. He uh. he's very talkative. Yeah. Too much mm. eat. Yeah, but just just looking at the positive and negatives, you know, this I'm, I'm not going to dig into this, and, and we can have a little discussion of how things may be vary in South Korea. But yeah. I I'm someone who really does believe hugely in showcasing the positive and the negative impacts uh, of what uh, you're doing. Wow! Well. And I always say to the students, if you ignore the negatives, if you try and to pretend that they're not they're not in existence, then you're going to have even bigger problems managing these issues later on. Mm. So sometimes it makes for a very uncomfortable conversation. It's people get a little bit awkward. But if you understand the negatives, then you can do something about it. And just in if you go to the top left hand corner as a negative, um, one of the challenges in many destinations is what's referred to as the increased cost of living. What do I mean by that? And Orlando is it going to exactly the same place. Many tourist destinations are very, very nice and they're attractive. They're nice places to visit. That's why they're tourism destinations. However, if they're a nice place to visit, they tend to be very nice places to live as well. Mm. So the knock-on effect, and it's something that you know Orlando is facing with, you're essentially building an infrastructure for tourists, but then more people want to come and live there because it's a nice, safe place. Mm. That then increases uh, property prices. It's then a problem for tourism because there's less available uh, accommodation for tourists. So you get this sort of cycle of, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an arms race in terms of uh, inflationary uh, activity across the industry. If you know that's going to happen, you can plan a little, you can't always stop it, but you can modify, you can change your type of tourism, um, you can change 
uh, to some extent it's seasonality you can change it spatially you try and stretch things out and certainly if you look at the day visitor map from london that we looked at before part of london's challenge is the main touristic appeal is very centralized it's very very uh, central to, to to the the way the river flows through through the city um but all these things there's nothing new in here what is new is people being very honest and uh dealing with you know the the good the bad and uh the ugly and and historically and it, it's really the purpose of what we're talking about today historically most of the measures have been economic measures and and you i think some of the sessions you've had have had sort of uh, economic professors um you'll be familiar with input output analysis the tsa's and the uh, CG modeling uh, that, that a lot of colleagues do. I would argue that's insufficient. Um, economics on its own, it really doesn't um, sort of solve all your problem. And what, what we're trying to do, this is a, essentially a project that there's a number of colleagues are working on at the moment. We're trying to sort of reconceptualize tourism so it's far more inclusive of the other uh variables and the other impacts and we we believe if you can do that you'll get a much more uh holistic or much fairer and more honest assessment of what tourism is all about rather than just this obsession on the money however and i, I must say however just think of yourselves if you're a politician and this is not a criticism of politicians at all. It's very, very, very difficult to stand up as a politician and say that you're trying to uh, be fairer to the community or you're trying to spread benefits because the vast majority of the industry are looking at that financial figure. They're looking at revenue, they're looking at tax receipts and just to give an indication of the scale of the theme parks here so the county so i live in the city of orlando but the the county the county area is called orange county as in the fruit the citrus fruit every single year the county receives around 250 million dollars of tax revenue purely through uh, a a six percent tax of the beds in Orange County, $250 million every single year, just from hotel beds. Mm. So the challenge is, if you're a politician, you become very reliant on that money. You become very reliant on volume. You become very reliant on that industry, actually, to clean your streets, to clean this, clean that, build schools, etc. So the challenge is once you've actually built a tourism economy a certain way, it's actually quite difficult to navigate away from it. So this is why the, imp the important decisions are at the very beginning. So at the outset, what is it that you want? What do you wish to achieve? How do you wish this to grow rather than reacting to, to, to the scenario? And what we're really looking at is a whole host of different data we're actually we're building basically a, a composite sort of dashboard to yes you're looking at the arrivals the departures the dollar receipts etc a little bit like london it's tourism intensity uh how dependent or competitive is that destination yes you can't ignore the economic factors but actually we're trying to look at how how does tourism really help and improve people's quality of life because the argument is if people are poorer if they're more miserable <laughs> if they're really unhappy and their health is detrimental what's the point what's the point and it's a very simple thing to say but it's really quite hard to break through the mindset where they're looking at the dollars the dollars the dollars or whatever the currency is and i guess what is really positive 
at the moment. What you're seeing, certainly in the United States, far more than you probably realize looking at the media, is not so much the resident fight back, but a resident realization that, hey, we do exist and there must be a better way of doing things. So there is a greater connection. And I can say, certainly from American example, most of the DMOs, the DMOs are destination management organizations. They are now being far more receptive to the need to be a little bit different than they've ever been before. And it's partly being driven by the need for workers, because the industry here is struggling to find post COVID, there's been a huge shortage of labor. I don't, I don't know if that's the same uh, in South Korea. And essentially your labor force are your local residents. They're the people that live there. So there's been a little bit of a wake up call. Um, and we're hoping that, that 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 will continue. But it's really taking all. You you mentioned the WTTC earlier in the introduction, Chalmer. But a really good organisation is is the WF. It's the World Economic Forum, and those competitiveness, the natural resources, cultural resources, they come from what's called the Travel and Tourism Competitive Index, mm. um, which is published every two years. I think it's every two years. And it, it, it's a it's a great uh, publication because it's it's giving all those components that contribute to tourism, be it air transportation, immigration, whatever, health and health and safety, etc. It, it it takes it at the national level, so it's very good at the macro level to to see what's going on, and really the well being elements those are certainly at the more localized level. But really, what we're trying to do is is pull all this data together, data together in a dashboard scenario, and I'll I'll show some of the um, metrics as as we're going through. And give give it two three minutes. I'll stop, and we we'll have a little uh, sort of questions, what have you. Um, a lot of a lot of the data. So what you saw in the previous slide is partly through resident surveys, surveys. It's partly through social media. It's partly through um, longitudinal tracking of visitor numbers, taxation receipts, uh, gasoline prices, you name it, a whole host of metrics that are being pulled together in partly through smart systems and what have you. So there's, there's a whole, um, whole sort of spaghetti soup, I guess, of data points and the means by which you're pulling that data together to try and make something more holistic rather than just a simplistic dollar amount or a simplistic uh, tax receipt amount uh, and, and this, this is what, what what we're trying to achieve and i guess i'll probably j just mention this slide and then we'll stop for a, a little chat is a lot of the data is actually published already and i'm sure you're you're familiar with with some of this we use gallup a lot so that there's the gallup world poll on particularly health well-being um lifespan education rates literacy all, all these sort of things and the idea is our, our our sort of dream really is or what we're working towards is instead of grouping destinations as urban destinations, coastal destinations, rural destinations, you know, the traditional uh, benchmarking of uh, places. What we would like to do is group destinations by their impact. So what can you may think Orlando may not have much in common with Seoul, but actually, if you're looking at its social cultural indicators, its well-being indicators, actually, it may have far more in common than what you realize. And so it, it's really a means to sort of group destinations in a slightly different way to refocus the management of those destinations on things that traditionally have been ignored and for destinations to view rather than viewing comparators purely by scale it's how it actually benefits people more fully 
uh, at the destination level through to, through its residents. Because I, I repeat, really, if your residents are worse off, what's the point? What's the point? <laughs> there, there is no point that, that, to, to a large degree. So what, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. And um, I've probably been talking for, oh, gosh, 40 minutes, longer than I thought. Um, okay. Anybody got any questions? Just we'll, we'll have a little sort of Q&A okay. break. I have a question. Um, you know, the tourism is often for uh, outsider, uh, yeah. often for uh, foreigners. So actually, you know, strangers, it's uncomfortable. Mm. But thinking about the money and mm. economy, have no choice but to accept those visitors for our economy and job opportunity. But however, think about the Brexit in UK. <gasps> oh, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> they made a decision close, yeah. Yeah. close yeah. their border from yeah. European mm. visitors, workers, and they choose their policy isolation from European continent, mm. which is because of a residence. Uh, the thinking and residence uh, power, mm. especially Caucasian, your Anglo-Saxon, mm. Caucasian uh, racist problem. Mm. But, you know, that is cause a very severely impact to UK economy situation. Mm. But people still wrong decision about, you know, their future. I don't know in uh, in, in United States, but here in, uh, these days are like uh, over tourism yeah there's the very negative uh, you know side of uh, tourism but it depends on their position and how they uh, uh, they show their attitude toward the tourism yeah. but you know as a tourist as a you know residence as a tourism professor as an economic professor as a other mm -hmm. business process they are all open for visitors because the money but yeah. Okay, well, let, let me pick, let me pick up on uh, let me pick up on a couple of your points. So um, I can't believe I'm talking about Brexit, living in America for a South Korean audience, but it's actually a very important point. So um, first of all, let me just say I I have I'm very biased because I have a French wife. I have, half my family are French, <laughs> so I'm very very Europe. I'm very European in my mindset. So I, I'll be very clear. So, but I'll try and be as objective as I can. So it, it's actually a very, very good example whereby a national, essentially a political decision is made rightly or wrongly, but which has massive implications for tourism. Mm. So the Brexit vote was um, 2016, I think. So it, it, it's, it's a few years ago now. And it's probably fair to say Britain has really struggled hugely since because what was promised basically is almost impossible to deliver. Mm -hmm. But that is a consequence of democracy, I guess, in a way. <laughs> um, and I would say it's been very destructive and been very negative on many, many fronts. Mm -hmm. However, the British economy is now very, very weak. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that if you're traveling from Europe or certainly if you're traveling from the United States, Britain is really, really cost effective to visit at the moment. Mm -hmm. So on the sort of uh, on the visitor front yes there is this somewhat negative view of foreign people that's partly what drove the, the brexit decision but it's actually made britain a very cheap place to go so for americans it's probably as cheap to go to britain now that it's been in nearly 30 years and it's quite interesting um, there's lots of studies around, well, if you don't like the politics of a country, do you avoid that country for touristic purposes? Most of the time, tourists divorce the two. They separate. And if it's cheap or if it's cost effective for them, 
that they will go they will go um i i would say you and, and i think most countries brexit is very very extreme but most countries have so the united states has lots of bizarre uh rulings where the united states is very different and south korea may be the same um for much of the united states there's a huge domestic market for tourism yeah. so florida 70 I, I mentioned at the beginning so we have 75 million visitors just just to my city every year prior to covid 90 percent of those 75 million are americans mm. yeah so the international visitation is much, much smaller. However, if you're in New Zealand, if you're in Fiji, if you're in the Caribbean, it's the total reverse. Different story. It's very, very different story. So I would always argue, and it goes back to my London image uh, at the beginning, you have to understand the destination that you're in. And the challenge that most uh, governments fail to see and brexit is a very very good example when um when governments are discussing policies and plans they tend to talk about the manufacturing economy they forget how big the service economy is huh. and britain is like the united states is primarily a service economy so tourism is huge but it doesn't get the political awareness that something like fishing or manufacturing or heavy engineering. So the mindset that your average voter doesn't see the service sector. So ju just give an indication and then we'll move on to another question. So I mentioned fishing. So fishing is a very um, emotive uh, issue in Britain. So. Uh, people are very, because it's an island, people are very close to the sea. They're very um, supportive of fishermen. Okay. But the fishing economy okay. is roughly equivalent. I don't know if you know Harrods Department Store. It's the most uh, famous department store in London. The fishing economy is almost the same size as one department store in London, okay. which is crazy. <laughs> but the emotive, the emotive vote is with the fishing not not with other things I see. Uh, what's okay, the background of some of the students i'd be interested to know what what what, what areas are some of the students working in don't all be shy <laughs> oh you know the korean we are shy now <laughs> yeah. 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 go ahead student okay mm -hmm. Is there is anybody working in tourism or are yeah, you some of the students uh part-time worker here uh some okay. are full-time so okay okay we have a student from france ah. uh, bonjour monsieur uh, madame bonjour elisa <laughs> <laughs> je me suis marié avec une française <laughs> <laughs> you do follow francis <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Lisa. How can I help you? Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you talked about the fact that um, that cities were attractive for tourists and also for the habitants, inhabitants, so when you all come there to live, and there was not that much uh, accommodation for tourists, and there is the kind of opposite in my city in France. Because there are kind of problem with the Airbnb in the Airbnb accommodation. Mm. Because many people are owner of Airbnb and so they prioritize tourists uh, instead of inhabitants. So it's kind of can you hear it here? Can you hear her voice? Yeah, the mostly the, the, the problems with the Airbnb, yes. Okay. And so in in some way I think tourism can these people, the owner of Airbnb, can benefit from the tourist tourism, but some other people cannot benefit from that. So what do you think about it? 
Yeah, Elisa, it, it's a really, really good question. And I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges for most cities over the past sort of four or five years. And in some ways, it's really, if, if you think about what Airbnb does, it's brilliant. Its simplicity is just brilliant because a lot of tourists, they want to see the real city. So they don't want to see what everybody else sees in Paris. What's your city in France, Elisa? Uh, it's a small city near Nantes, northwest. Of ah, Nantes. okay. My sister-in-law lives in Nantes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, it, it, it's perfect in for a lot of visitors. Airbnb gives them the opportunity to live in a proper neighborhood and see the proper city away from the tourists. So at a simplistic level, it's marvelous. However, it's scale again at a relatively small scale that works really, really well. If it's uncontrolled, it goes back to my slide earlier on. If it's uncontrolled, if the local politicians don't act quick enough, it takes over. And this is really what's been happening in many places. So it's the classic case. Once you pass a certain threshold, that residential area then becomes a tourist centre in its own right, which really wasn't the intention. And it's, it's really a case of... As soon as these things start, politicians have to move a lot, lot quicker because you can manage this. It's it's like it's like everything in 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 life. It's uh, Elisa, you know the French paradox. You know, wine, cheese, food, everything is fine in moderation, and it's the same with tourism. The problem is the reaction time to these things is really, really, really slow. And to a large extent, the damage is done. What, what a few cities do, essentially when these things start, it's very difficult to control. But I guess the most frustration, frustrating point is when these things go wrong, other cities should learn much quicker. Huh. But there's, there seems to be this sort of uh, ingrained belief, oh, but that won't happen here. Well, of course it will happen unless you do something about it. It's like the crew, it's very similar to the cruise ship scenario. Well, of course it's going to be the same unless you do something different. And you can control it through your planning. So where, where, where I live, for example, it's banned. It, it, so it's very zonal. So you can do it through taxes. You can do it through planning. You know, there are ways around these things. But... I, I guess a lot of it, it always comes down to a compromise. There's a lot of people make a lot of money. The, uh, Venice is always thrown as example, uh, Florence in Italy. But at the same time, there's a lot of people making a lot of money. The, the challenge is to keep it balanced and well managed. So actually in London, Chilmer, Wimbledon, Richmond, that the, the southwest part of London, it's a similar sort of problem. Okay. 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 But no, it's, it's a good, quite a very good question, Eliza. Very, very good question. Thank you. Another student? Um, I have a question. Okay, speak up, please. Um, Hello, Jeanette. Hello, Jenna. Hey, how are you? <laughs> ah, give me a sec. Can you hear me better? Yes, yes, speak up. Um, speaking of the European tour, like travel to uh, Europe, after pandemic uh, as Asian, we kind of scared to going to the Europe, to be honest with you, because of there is some kind of uh, like racism going on because of the, this COVID is actually from um, China. So uh, there is a lot of media going on that uh, the European is not really preferred to see the Asian on the street. So they... <laughs> they so it is kind of like, what is the solution for it? Because of, you know, as a European and you come from France, then yeah. what are you thinking about how you guys can solve this kind of problem? And then, you know, imaging nearly for Asian to kind of the scary to going to the Euro. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think the issue that you raise is real. I, I do think there's a big, big difference between... Uh, 
and the United States is not that different in a way, I guess, it's you open this one. Um, what you see in the media is not necessarily what you see in reality. And the American media is terrible. It's just, oh, geez, it, it, it's bad. Um, so I would say, yes, I would be lying if I, I would be lying if I said, no, there's no problem at all. That because fundamentally, that's not true. Is the problem really big? No, I don't believe it is at all. Um, but the I, I put it down to the 24 seven media who just keep pushing and pushing and pushing sort of negativity. Um, yes, it's there. But I don't think it's anywhere as big as people realize and in some cases it goes back to the brexit issue as well in the sense that yes you'll always get an element of the population but actually they'd much rather have your tourist dollars irrespective of where you come from uh, and most of these things uh gina it's just pure ignorance at the end of the day um but that is just, it's pushed through certain media channels and it, it's very, it, it's very difficult to, to handle it sometimes. And, and certainly the United States there has, when President Trump came to power in, I think, was that 2016? Um, or maybe 2018, I'll get my year, yeah, 2016. There, there was definitely a drop off in visitation to the United States, definitely. However, Again, it goes back to my London map. Where do most um, where do most international visitors visit when they come to the United States? They go to the major cities. They go to New York. They go to uh, San Francisco. They come to Orlando. They go to Miami. Elisa, Miami is full of French. Okay, they all go to Miami. Okay, all the cities are primarily heavily Democrat. So politically, they're, they're the other side. So just because you've got someone in power who may have a particular view, where you're going as a tourist is normally completely different. So it's a strange, so it's a really good example of guns. A good example of this is guns. And guns obviously are a huge problem in the United States no matter how bad the situation is in the United States, it tends not to impact tourism at all. And the reason being, when you come to the United States as a tourist, your chance of seeing a gun are almost zero. Because, oh. the, pla because the places where you go, where you're visiting, tend not to have the problems. It's more dangerous to live here than it is to visit as a tourist. It's bizarre, but that's the reality. So no matter how bad the gun situation, it tends not to impact tourism. So I think there's some parallel with, with your question. It's weird, but that's, that, that, that's, that's how it manifests itself. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, other? People uh, come and go and trans, continent and trans, you know, national, uh, we are become more globalization and due to the Netflix, you know, this Netflix effect is a shoes these days, Korean culture, media and entertainment uh, go widely to all of the world. What do you think? Oh, no, no, I agree. Well, everybody here knows Korean pop. I don't, I'm too old. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think one, one of the strange things going on at the moment is of, obviously, you know, we, we talk about um, globalization still and connectivity. Actually, the world's becoming very fragmented. Fragmented. It's very fragmented. So, mm. you know, China has its way. We have the situation with Russia and Ukraine. Parts of Africa are quite isolated. So the... Uh, and Europe, Europe always has an issue of, of something, but it, it is quite interesting how the world isn't really one happy whole at the moment. Um, but I, but I will say there's always there's always losers, but there's also winners. So ironically, you know, one of the questions is when there's a disaster 
or when there's all these crises, does tourism stop? It may do, but it always comes back really, really quickly, really quickly. No matter what happens, it comes back quickly, as we mentioned with the COVID. So certainly in the United States at the moment, where a lot of the investment from the United States is going, it's going into Colombia, it's going into Chile, it's going into Peru and South America. So Central and South America. So that part of the world has its problems of a slightly different nature, but a lot of Americans are now looking to Central and South America rather than Europe, Asia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And certainly the investment in by the hotel companies and actually a lot of sustainability efforts as well, because a lot of the development going on is in actually quite sensitive areas. So there's actually quite a lot of very proactive uh, uh, planning going on, which is actually quite a good thing. Um, but South America, which you tend not to hear much about, but for my part of the world here in Florida, it's it, it's significant now. Um, Panama, Costa Rica, even places like Guatemala, very, very uh, vibrant in terms of their where, where they're going in tourism development. But no, globalization isn't quite as happy and smiley as it was previously. No, it, 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 it's different. Yeah. Let me show another globalization. One student from Myanmar. Myanmar. Uh, okay. So Okay. Hello, Professor. Speak up, please. Oh, hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes. Okay. One of my best ever. One of my best ever students came from Myanmar. Oh, really? So, yeah. Good to hear that. Okay. Uh, I have a simple question. It's like when I saw your slide, you you've got a plenty of experience, especially with the developing countries. So mm -hmm. I just pop up that simple questions. My question is like, uh, could you please share your opinions that what was the biggest challenges in marketing for those uh, destinations in that time? And are they are still in the early states in the development or those changes are stay in uh, stay the same after the COVID? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest challenge without a shadow of doubt is it goes back to a theme I mentioned two or three times. The biggest challenge is to really get the message across to politicians and the decision makers to really understand tourism before they make the big decisions. Mm. And it's just part of the problem because of, uh, in, in all countries you have a slightly different political cycle. Politicians are never there for very long. So there might be three years, four years, five years, then everybody changes, everybody changes. So you've got this constant cycle. And the reason they're important is because most of the infrastructure is publicly funded. It's, it's a public investment. So you can't, I'm not obsessed with politicians, but you can't avoid the political dimension in tourism. You just can't. Um, so, so for a, an example at the moment, we're doing a lot with Saudi Arabia. As are a lot of French, actually, these are a lot of French companies are in Saudi Arabia at the moment. There's huge developments taking place in Saudi Arabia uh, where they're developing new cities and very touristic and sort of leisure related cities. But they're, they're trying to move too quick. <laughs> And it's like, guys, slow down, understand what you're doing, and then it will be far, far better. But there's a little bit of a gold rush. Egypt's doing something similar. So you, you're getting new cities on like the Red Sea and in the northern uh, Mediterranean to, to the, what is it, to the west of Cairo. So you're having this rush. It's partly driven by their population. It's partly driven by they, they, they got the money, but it's always the same. I, it, it's trying to just get those in power to fully understand what they're doing. And the biggest problem is the general perception is tourism is easy. It's not easy. If it was easy, nothing would ever go wrong. <laughs> But it, 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 it's one of those, and, you know, if you study tourism, I, I always say to my students, my, my mother, who's 82, she thinks she knows every, about, everything about the global aviation industry because she's flown on a few planes. 
So people, because they've partaken in it, they think they understand it, which is a really big flaw because they don't. And, and I guess the other thing, um, I don't know your country at all, I'm afraid, but I know, I know Thailand very well, I know Malaysia and Indonesia very well. They're all very, very, very different how they do things. So Malaysia is not the same as Singapore. It's just not. And it's not the same as Indonesia. So you've got different priorities, different um, politics, different forms of organisation. So I all those tourism... From England. Yeah. Sorry? You came, from in, you came from England originally. That's why you understand the very well cultural aspect of the, all of the world. If you are born in America, it's a totally different story. But of course, totally. America, they don't yeah. understand very well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, they understand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I would say it, 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 it depends on your orientation. Um, and I, I, I always think island communities, so Britain is an island, you have a slight advantage because you're always looking external. But then how did Brexit occur then? So clearly that didn't, didn't work. Um, no, I think it's more than that. I, I think it's, I would say it doesn't matter what you do in life, but you have to understand the basics of what you're going into. And certainly for tourism, so for, from a Myanmar perspective, I, um, and you could say Vietnam's in, in a similar position, really Thailand is the touristic powerhouse. Mm. So they're the hub. They're the source of the supply chains. They're the source, a lot of the money, a lot of the labor, a lot of the food stuff. So Myanmar and Vietnam may develop very well, but Thailand is a huge beneficiary mm. because it, 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 it's the hub in that part of the world. So you're, you're never really going to fight that, but you can understand. So what does it mean if you're a slightly more peripheral player? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to my industry? How can you tap into the benefit and actually do things better? Thailand made mistakes in the 1970s and the 1980s. You don't have to make the same mistakes. But the okay, we have another student's uh, questions. Um, okay, go. Go ahead. Oh, we're on a roll now. <laughs> yeah. Hi, popular. Professor. Hello. So, nice to see you. Hi. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Jong. Um, I actually used to be in charge of sending out the newsletter for the Academy. So it's very nice to ah, meet you, fellow. Okay. Um, Lovely. Very so nice I, to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I, I know Professor uh, Chong very well. Oh, yes. That's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, my question was, um, in your slide, you've mentioned uh, tourism impacts, the positives and negative consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to evaluating those impacts, um, a lot of the scholars now recognize the importance of a resident's well-being or quality of life. But that aspect itself is such a complex dimension to measure. So I was just wondering if you have any specific indicators that you personally think is important or it has been neglected but is worth bringing in. Yeah, no, uh, and it's interesting. It, it was one of my last slides. So we, we, it's, it's far more interesting talking rather than showing slides. So let me give you an example. So the city of Orlando has, they spent a year basically trying to address exactly your question. And they narrowed it down to, they, they've got 60 data points which they collect data for, for, for these measures. And they're able to do that primarily through a range of what I would call very old fashioned data <laughs> collection techniques and very smart high tech stuff. Um, but one of the biggest challenges they have, it actually goes back to the London map, it's really identifying where do the tourists really go? So it's a lot of it is about tracking and flow. So they're measuring things like a car registration plates in different parts of the city. So if you're a non-local, they can see where you're coming. We have, um, it, it, I 
is he South Korean? Well, one of the presses I work with, yes, Andrew uh, Bong Yum, he, he's South Korean. They do lasers and heat maps. So they're looking at crowds, they're looking at volume, it's looking at facial recognition. There's loads of different things that they're essentially pulling together. But ultimately, it, it, it's actually quite a challenge, but this is why we're pursuing it, because from the city perspective, they need to demonstrate how tourism is benefiting their residents. Is it financial? Is it social cultural? Is it linguistic? Is it their broader education? Whatever. OK, so all these things are coming into the equation. The problem, it takes a lot of time. And by the time you get all the information, things have moved on. So this is where the sort of smartness comes in. So where you're getting data on a sort of continuous basis. So, but no, it's a challenge, but essentially it's what we're trying to do. It's what we're trying to do. And it's partly as a means to justifying tourism. It's partly as a means to arguing for more diversification. It's more of a means of spreading the benefits um, and also means to get people more engaged so they understand what is actually going on. Oh, so are you saying that, in your opinion, the flow of tourists is largely the influencing factor for the quality of life for the residents? It, 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 it's partly. And the reason I say that, because if you're getting it, it goes back to Elisa's question on the Airbnb. So you're trying to identify where are tourists, where are they going, where are they staying, where are they spending? And, and it's not just their spend. France is actually a very good example where they, they have lots of sort of residential tourists. It has a direct impact on schools. It has a direct impact on kindergartens, it has a direct impact on many things. Um, so if you've got many, many people in Airbnb, for example, if you have too many, then it's very detrimental to the education of locally because you haven't got the demand for the school. So the, the, whole, um, the whole shape and dynamic of the, the, the population, it, it's moving. So that's, that's why it's really important to, to keep it together. The, yeah, the, 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 one, the, one, the one, one thing to add is one of the things what we're trying to show is if you don't have tourism, are you better or worse off? Because part of the challenge, I would say most of my career, all the discussion has been tourist growth, 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 growth. Well, that may actually not be the right thing to do. So it's really trying to establish to what extent are you are you benefiting or are you not benefiting and are there other forms of um, business diversification that are to the overall betterment for your destination rather than continual tourism growth okay another, me, another student oh, sorry. okay hello constantly okay hi professor can you hear me Yes, very, very clearly. Thank you. I'm totally on the same page nowadays. Many of tourism and your report are just saying about all the dollars. Mm. So I was realized that the role of destination marketing organization could be tremendously important because they can be a medium of delivering, um, not delivering, sorry transferring economy impact to social impact and delivering it community directly. But thankfully, some of the extensions are attempting to change their role. So I would like to ask you about, what about Orlando? Visit Orlando if they have tactic. So I would like- I'm just, to I'm just gonna sh uh, share a screen. Just to just to 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 show something related to your to your question. Uh, do excuse me. I'm going to click through loads just to show something. Or oh, I've passed it. I went too quick. 
Yeah, let, let me just related to that question. It, it's a really good question. Let, let, let me give two examples. So the, these, these are very current. So the first one is Edinburgh in Scotland. So this is, this is the city where I was born. My family is Scottish, but I was raised in, in Southern England. Um, so this is something that uh, literally was what launched last week. And I think it addresses your question. And I've got an example from Orlando afterwards. So Edinburgh is a very popular business event city, conferences, conventions. It's a beautiful city. If you like whiskey, it's just wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but they've just launched this tour. And I noticed it because essentially that this is what we're working towards. So this is a means of um, really monitoring well-being, food choice, volunteering levels and social interactions from business events, okay? So rather than just looking at the dollars, they, they, they've obviously identified these are the areas that are important to them. And this is what they're, they're, they're trying to record. OK, and this is through the airport, the convention centre, the museums. So it, it, I put it in bold. It's a very community based means to try and showcase how tourism is impacting other areas. And I totally commend them for it. It's like, yes, OK, th th this is this is the way forward for Orlando. Um, this this is it's only a screenshot so I, I, I can't go into a lot of depth depth but i can't this is what i call a small step but actually it's a major step at the same time so for the first time ever in july of this year the the dmo and this is the probably the single largest dmo in the united states it, it's huge it's bigger than new york it's bigger than uh, Las Vegas. But for the first time ever, they now have on their website, Orlando, a sustainable destination. And OK, it's just the website for the moment. But if, if I were to click on um, the, the grey tabs to the right, it's looking at everything from what the theme parks are doing, what the hotels are doing, what the transportation are doing, um, Greenworks Orlando is a community initiative. So what, what are the local residents doing in terms of food waste or all this sort of thing? And, OK, it's a long, long way to go, but it's a very positive start. And what is quite interesting, what, one of the ironies, and it goes back to some of your other questions, one of the ironies, the sustainability of cities per se is way, way, way ahead of the sustainability of places as a destination. So in terms of transportation, waste, and a whole host of other things um, at the local level, there's actually a lot of activity and that's got to push out to the tourism people more and more. So this is a really positive, um, step. It's small, but it's very refreshing that at last they're beginning to recognize that these things are actually important. And I was the reason they're doing it is quite interesting. And it's partly to do the changing generations. So most people, when they come to Orlando, they're not choosing Orlando as a green destination. People going to Edinburgh are not choosing Edinburgh as a green or inclusive destination. But when they're there, they expect something to be done. So it's not really a choice criteria, but they expect to see something done. And funny enough, one of the one of the it's a bit of a dark theme to talk about, but one of the very um, one of the very good initiatives here is on human trafficking. OK, human trafficking is a huge problem uh, for labour and for sex. It, you know, it's a really, really big problem, okay. but it's a very strong collaborative effort and it's very visible. So you as a tourist 
you see that, oh my gosh, this is really bad, but at least they're doing something. So the visibility, these things have always been going on, but I think the visibility, people expect to see some sense of social responsibility now. They expect to see some sense of sustainability. They may not put it as their top criteria for coming to see you, but they expect it to be there. So I think this is actually a very good thing, and it's primarily the younger markets rather than uh, the old guys like me. So it, it, it's actually a positive. Okay. The sustainable issue is another important issue to us. Anyway, any other questions from students? It's just a sure question. I just wondering about if the Orlando is actually kind of the provide all for sustainable destiny, destination that if where, uh, whether they get the, some privilege from the government, government is supported this kind of like concept of the tourism. Okay, very, very, very interesting. Okay, how do I, how do I say this <laughs> carefully? Um, there's a big, big difference in the United States between the federal government and the state government so obviously the united states has 50 states they are very 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 different in how they manage culturally they're very different i would say at the federal level so washington dc the support is fantastic they get it they understand it so there's a lot of money on the table for all these sort of green infrastructural developments electric vehicles electric power, um, solar power, all these things. Um, it, it, it's actually very, very impressive. At the state level, it varies hugely, varies hugely. And Florida is, is a Republican state. And let's say there's certain views that I find a little bit odd. Um, but Florida's primarily problem is very low. So we, we had a devastating hurricane about three weeks ago, which was bad. It was re really bad. Um, but part of the problem for it, it's very, very low. So it's not so much the hurricane that's the problem. It's what they refer to as the storm surge. So we had a, a similar probably to Japan gets it a lot. I'm not sure about South Korea, but 15 foot waves crashing into the coast. That, that's a big wave. That's a big wave. And we are about 90 minutes from the coast, uh, Orlando, but even here, by the time the hurricane hit here, there's people literally half a mile from where I'm sitting who were being air rescued from their houses due to the floodwaters. It's like, wow. Okay. And it's primarily people in the older properties. If you're in a new property, they're built to very different standards and different requirements. Okay. Um, but no, I would say generally, federal government is very, very positive, and America is a huge leader uh, in many, many ways. But at the the state level, it, it, it varies hugely. Uh, um, and funny enough, it, I can use Disney as an example. So roughly half of Disney parks are all um, energy comes from solar. Okay. So that the, there's a lot, there's a lot more that can be done, um, but it's far more than be, the, the Europeans tend to think America's a bit of a backwater. That's because of the sort of national politics and the blah, blah, blah. But when you look at the individual cities, it's actually quite impressive what, what's going on. You just don't tend to see it in the national and international uh, media. But okay. behind the scenes, that there's a lot going on. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Alan, uh, can you go back to your slide about it continually? Yeah, cool. uh, uh, I was just, I was, can I just ask one question? What's sure. the single biggest challenge in South Korea at the moment from a touristic point of view? What, 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 what's your country's big challenge in um, terms of tourism? My personal uh, point of view, um, Korea has become world-renowned culture. Uh, which is very positive side and then that bring more attention to Korean culture and the people uh, coming in to Korea because of those competitive mm -hmm. aspects. Mm -hmm. But originally we don't have, we, we, we don't much the tourism in the heritage 
resource mm. comparing Europe and Japan and China. But my point of view is a selection. People from America, people from Japan, uh, people from Europe, they choose one of the country among three country, China, Japan, and Korea. Okay. What do you think uh, when you come to East Asia? Mm. Probably you prefer to go China or prefer to go Japan. Lastly, to come uh, Seoul or mm. South Korea. So we have to confront the competition with the Japan and China mm. and first. But these days, you know, Korean, the pop culture is uh, driving those inbound tourism, which is very critical. Um, mm. And uh, still, I believe Korea is one of the, the industrial country, like yeah. uh, Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. Uh, yeah. So policy is much more uh, centered mm -hmm. on those industrial uh, the management and rather than tourism. So tourism mm -hmm. is a very tiny percentage of yeah, the GDP are in Korea. Yeah. So politicians don't care much about the tourism. Yeah, that's no, my point it, of view. Yeah, no, no, and I understand. And I guess that the state of Florida, it, it's the total opposite because tourism is absolutely essential. Um, and I think what, one of the things where tourism, is, the benefits underestimated is touristic places are kept primarily clean. They're kept primarily safe. Mm. And certainly where I live, the Orlando is not a big city, but it's sports stadia, it's theatres uh, and whatever. They're world class. They're stunning, absolutely stunning. And it's way beyond what a city of this population would normally have. But that's primarily through the tourist tax dollars. So our, our downtown theatre is totally, totally world class. It's stunning. That's paid for by tourist tourist dollars and and to some extent I, I guess that has historically been a means to keep the local population quiet oh stop moaning about tourists because we've given you a nice indoor arena or keep quiet because you've got a beautiful theater that's not enough now it's got to be much deeper than that but historically that has that has kept things uh yeah, kept, kept, kept things going okay, okay let me um let me have a where are we oops you're fine until you till you stop aren't you yeah 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 okay let let me um good, good, good. how long how long have we got to uh, chill moon uh 30 minutes oh wow Okay. Oh, I tell you what I'm going to do then, I because uh, I'll send you this. Let me. Um, Good. Yeah, wow. yeah. Let, what I'll do, I just spent about twenty minutes talking. That this is a project that we finished uh, very recently, actually, and, and we, we would. Th this is a project on. It's it's more coastal, um, but I, I think it, it it there's some there's some good in indicators because the question earlier was like you know what you're actually looking for there's some good indicators here that we can look at so this is a project that it, it was a huge international team but we were we were some of the main authors i was author number four which was cool um and it was really a case of looking at the coastal and marine tourism so it was very specific it, it was um presented it's called the ocean panel so it's part of the united nations and it was presented in lisbon about two three months ago um and it, it's really it, it's really a document to sort of showcase how things can be improved at, 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 the, at the sort of marine level um and it you know a, a lot of it relates to what to what we're looking at but I, i'm gonna zip through a little bit and um, what, one of the things that's really interesting is I, i'm just moving my images over here yeah is people again they don't realize the scale of tourism to what in this case is the ocean economy so you're looking at sea transportation you're looking at high tech you're looking at fishing it's all dwarfed when you bring in tourism so tourism is just huge 
So one of the challenges of the industry now is a lot of the good ideas, they tend to be very good ideas at the small scale. I, my argument is, well, how do you take a good idea at the small scale to an industry that's $1.2 trillion? Or how do you take a good idea, which is very good at the small scale, to a city like Orlando that's got 75 million visitors? So everything has to be scaled up. And I think part of the problem that the industry has got is where they're finding good practice. It, there's really good practice everywhere, but it tends to be quite small. How do you bring that up? And I would say the single biggest problem that tourism has got being more sustainable in the future has got nothing to do with tourism. It's the global population. So population growth is huge, particularly in parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East, India, Pakistan, uh, and whatnot. You know, it, it, it's months ago. All those people need things to do. They need food to eat, and they will go and visit places at some point. So it, 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 it's it's a huge, huge, huge uh, scale. And really, I'm showcasing this because it just shows it's the same things going on everywhere. Um, disruption is there. COVID has been a bit a bit of a nightmare, and what really is the case it, it's the first uh, sentence really on, on the blue at the bottom and it's talking about the current model most of the existing model for tourism has been a corporate model so this may be like a south korean model so it's large companies building their hotels all over the world and the benefit going back to i mentioned uh, thailand with uh, myanmar earlier the benefit goes to bangkok rather than rangoon for example and this is something that's trying to change so one of the positive things i said earlier hopefully i mentioned the fact that the united states a lot of the focal point on development is central and south america what they're trying to do, even the big companies, so Hyatt is a major uh, investor in South America at the moment, is they are acutely aware if they're going to succeed longer term, they can't just do the usual model, build a hotel, take all the money out, no benefit for the local uh, community. So it's, it's a much more integrated means of trying to do development at the moment because if you keep it going it, the, the, it will continually never ever uh improve so this is what the, this document um was all about and as i say you, you you'll see this where, where when i said i'll pdf it to you uh, it, it it was really broken down to sort of impacts uh, what, what's referred to as regenerative tourism at the moment and actual resilience and resilience is more about the long-term durability so sustainability is more preservation conservation etc resilience is is durability and the, the a lot of the academic book at the moment is in 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 the area of resilience and and it's interesting i would say from a from an industry point of view tourism is very very resilient no matter what happens tourism continues the challenge is places aren't particularly resilient so the tourist will just move the tourist is very flexible if there's a problem in france yeah they go to spain if there's a problem in spain they go to portugal that if there's a problem in florida they go to south carolina or mexico so the tourists just keep continuing but the place itself uh, has challenges so everything from construction from design education of the labor force flexibility of the labor force all these things are feeding into a slightly different model uh, as you move through. So, it, it, and, and a lot of it comes down to actually local financing, local partnerships. So rather than the hotel groups in particular going in on their own, they're doing a far more partnership activity. So they're trying to embed themselves uh, in, in, in the communities that they're going into ra rather than just, just the old model. And I think the challenge, it's actually, if you go down to, um, it's partly three, it's part, it's all of these, it's partly three, partly five. 
The, the first one is agreeing on what, and this goes to one of the, the questions that the student asked, and it, it's the last few slides. What data do you actually collect? What indicators do you really focus on? And, and I've got the examples from this in a moment. Um, and it's really great. What really makes a difference and what, what really counts? Um, item four is about the value chain. So it's like your supply chain. And interestingly, a lot of the problems is the supply chains don't exist in, in many countries. So it's not that the tourism development is ignorant of these issues. It's just they can't get the supply chain. The supply chains are a problem worldwide at the moment, as you know, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but the biggest challenge is five. It's, all, it's where most of my work has been in terms of how do you encourage people to actually work collectively together? Because ultimately, you're all going in the same direction. And what is probably the most impressive thing about where, where I live and work, as a city, Orlando is very, very collaborative. So government, industry, the university, we are, everything is totally integrated as one. So just imagine, it's what I said to you before, you've got a destination that's got 75 million visitors when COVID came, it had the emergency management group. My dean was the co-chair of that group. So you've got a huge industry, but they include academia at the top table. That's really unheard of in many destinations. So it's, it's a place that's very inclusive of every element has a contribution to make. So, you know, it, 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 it's positive. So th this is, uh, let me move myself here. So he here are the sort of indicators and th th they, they cover for the full um, sphere of environmental and social cultural. So these are the type of indicators that were re are really being advocated to destinations and in this context, very much at the um, coastal uh, and marine era. So, and again, it goes back to if you're managing tourism, you have to think of water quality, you have to think of solid waste, you have to think of energy, um, because if you're using the energy, there may be less energy for the residents. So this is the classic case of who's getting the energy that's available. Water is a huge problem. Who gets the water? In many parts of the world, the water is going to the tourists, the clean water does not go to the local residents. So it's like, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's really not what should be happening. So it, it's, it's taking all these things. Um, sewage, water treatment, you've got the conservation and reservation, uh, restoration, drinking water quality. So again, all these things really are, so many, so many parts of the world, these things have been sacrificed for the local community, but they have, because the benefits primarily gone to the tourists. So we tend to focus on education. Clean water is a huge problem in the United States, actually. It's a massive problem. Um, and it's very much depends on where you live. If you're in a nice neighborhood, it's perfect. If you're in a poor neighborhood, it's terrible, which clearly is just wrong. OK, but, uh, you know, the, these are things that, 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 that need to be um, improved. Yes, you're still going to have the economic um, elements there, but I think it's the next slide. Yeah. So things like indigenous representation, uh, inclusion and accessibility, um, health well-being, all these things are now widely considered as or they should be as standard indicators of progress. Um, funnily enough, a lot of my work at the moment is on the inclusion and access accessibility. So people with physical dis disabilities, learning disabilities, um, it's actually quite encouraging how much work is going on behind the scenes in the United States for that particular group, because you're talking about one in five of your visitors have some form of disability. So it's a, it's a staggering number. Historically, they've been completely ignored. 
in any form of development. So it's it's these things that that, that are really coming on on form and just looking at the top there the effects of tourism on communities the social services so healthcare is hugely important is that healthcare if it's going to the tourists our use and this goes back to where the tracking of the tourists where they go how they spread out is really important because it tells you the type of services that they will use as well so it's like the airbnb question earlier okay if you've got a heavy concentration of Airbnb, they will use the, the health and social service, but they use them in a slightly different way because their illnesses are slightly different. You know, everything changes if you're a resident or, or a visitor. Um, so all these things that really, really come in. And I, I think one of the big challenges here, when I first came here 10 years ago, it's quite funny, actually, Chilmo, the question was, I was at Universal Studios and their question was, do you think we should have signs in Spanish? And I was like, what a stupid question. I thought, I said, well, how, how many of your visitors are Spanish speaking? Oh, about 40%. So I said, well, don't you think it'd be a good idea to have signs in Spanish then? It, it's like, what a daft question. But it's amazing how people think. Whereas now, there's Spanish and Portuguese signs, most of the announcements in Spanish. And actually, Orlando is like a bilingual. Um, it, it's English and Spanish everywhere. I, I'm a French speaker. Complete waste of time here. <laughs> Everybody speaks Spanish. But it's amazing how something so simple doesn't resonate with people who are managing this, this stuff. It's like, well, if 40% speaking Spanish, of course you need Spanish. Why wouldn't you? It, it, it's just, just crazy. Um, so th those are uh, an example of the indicators. And then th this is just where we, we come on to finish, really, I guess. But uh, this is a paper I did with two, two colleagues on Orlando. And these are the things that they're actually looking at. So, so as a city, um, and, and a big push here is renewable energy. And certainly being in a state where there's huge amounts of sunshine, every single house, every single school and building really should have solar panels, but they don't. And they don't because the politics comes in in terms of protection of the older energy companies that really don't want to lose their market. So, so you're, you're always dealing with politics somewhere down, down the line. Um, but it's a huge area for electric vehicles. Um, uh, Orlando is the home of the drone. So we have about 10 miles from where I live. There's a huge testing pad for uh, autonomous vehicles and autonomous, um, like mini heli so large drones. Um, because what, one of the unique things about here is, yes, we're a very tourism economy, but NASA, the space mission at Cape Canaveral, is just 40 minutes down the road. So you've got a lot of very, very high tech, um, very, very, you know, top end um, sort of rocket and drone GPS type activity going on. So it, it's, quite, it's quite a good fusion between the two. Um, if you look at the core actors on towards the, the sort of second to last column on the right, you, you can't do anything without the political buy-in. And, and what makes this place such a good place to live and work is the city and the county really do understand there. It is probably the only place I've ever lived where they, they almost fully understand tourism. They don't have all the answers, but at least the effort is being made and there's a comprehension of things that, that can be done. The challenge is, so we're, we're in a strange situation where, where the public sector understand that the major industry here, it's a very corporate model. It's Disney, it's high. It's, so you, you're dealing with major, major corporations who aren't necessarily based here. So the decision makers uh, are elsewhere. Disney, for example, this is where they made the money, but their headquarters in Burbank, California. Um, but no, it, it gives an indication of the type of things that that that, that are go, that are going on. And uh, I just wanted to actually finish. Uh, I'm just going to zip through because I know time is is a little bit tight. Um, 
yeah, oops, yeah. What, all, all this stuff in a, in a way is the big driver now is clearly the technology. And our challenge is how do you achieve this sustainable development? How do you get this data? How do you do the manage in essentially the technology age? So we, we work a lot with our College of Engineering and Computer Science, and we actually have a joint degree, it's called Travel Technology and Analytics, which seems awfully sexy, but a lot of the driver for this is as a means to record, measure, monitor more sustainable forms of tourism. So it, it's really, it's using the technology as a means to record the water, record the, 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 the quality of this, the quality of that. So it, it's very a monitoring, monitoring, measuring, real-time information. That is the huge challenge. And we're nowhere near at completion, but that's really where, where it's going on. And so for people like yourself, it's quite interesting. Our in terms of our education and how we're directing people, we're now attracting a lot of people with a STEM, it's a science, technology, engineering and math background rather than a tourism background. So they understand choice models, algorithm development that then can be applied in the travel and tourism sector. So we will always have the, the broad programs, but essentially it's a slightly different shift because the solutions to what we're talking about are primarily solutions that will be found through the technology. I don't understand all this stuff, but my job is to educate these people so they understand tourism, where my colleagues explain the engineering components that they can actually come up with solutions so it's a combination of lasers and all sorts of very fancy gadgets but actually they're trying to record data for decision making so that that's really where a lot of this goes and i guess I guess a couple of final points the challenge with the coastal study is the urban centers. So the urban cities tend to be very good at this sort of thing because they're quite compact. Destinations on the coast, infrastructure is not always as good and they're more spread out. So you have a sort of infrastructural challenge to get all this stuff together. So it is quite interesting where the, the most smart cities tend to be very compact cities where they're, they're easier to record the data but you know that 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 that, that will come uh in time and just an example of the type of companies that work in all these companies help are helping us um they helped us develop and improve the program and nearly all of these companies now they have very big social agendas as well so i think this is what you're finding and i guess this is really encouraging it's not just the public sector that's driving the change now it's these companies as well so they know if they want young talent they have to have a mission that is far different to maybe what it was five or 10 years ago. Otherwise they don't get the best talent. So it is quite interesting how you might think, well, what, what's the connection to to all well-being? It, the young people, they, they want to see the inclusion of these things in the companies in their day-to-day -day activity. So if it's not there, it really does uh, become uh, a problem. Anyway, my, my daughter laughs because I always finish on this slide because I think I look a bit younger. <laughs> so so, so it's, it's total vanity. There's not there's nothing else about it, but it, it makes me feel better. Okay. <laughs> anyway, how old but, are you? Oh, I'm not telling. That's a, that's a surprise. <laughs> 55. Uh nearly. Yeah, very good. Very 56. 56. You're seven older than me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, you yeah. you offered very good program to the students. Uh that program actually necessity for you know 
new student and the student must learn the kind of engineering and technical and scientific analytics and devices and um, data uh, skills. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe uh, tourism is a human nature's issue. As human nature is a genetically and instinctively, we pursuing very the well-being and uh, beauty and aesthetic point and nature is, but however, these days uh, that is part of tourism and tourism and hospitality, but methodologically and the method actually providing by the all the AI systems solution and smart applications and robot and services. So jobs there, right? Job opportunity is much huge uh, there for, so I, I believe the students must learn the kind of data analytics and information processing. Uh, yeah, absolutely we need the nature of the tourism. So that's why we have made the program Smart Tourism and the Smart Tourism Education Platform for graduate students, uh, like what you made. Yeah. Yeah, it, anyway. it, 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 it's partly because you then have the data where you can influence the decision makers. That that's yeah, the key. That's right. You've got that's the right. hard data to show where people are, what their behavior is, and then it's far more convincing. So that's where it comes in. That's, that's where right. it comes in. Yeah. So like you old people and uh, doesn't necessary to learn the data. I'm uh, too old for that. Uh, but it <laughs> needs to understanding the implication of the the yes. data and the data providing to us the implication and uh, uh, insight from there. Yeah, and and students, uh, question, few more questions we take, and we have uh, ten minutes left. Uh, uh, professor, uh, okay, go ahead first. Um. Thank you. Professor, I have a question um, about your coastal study and the marine tourism. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was working in Maldives for a couple of years before. Oh, okay. And I, what, I, what I have seen was there, um, as you said, the, the government, uh, the support from the government and the international organization is very important for, uh, for the environmental sustainability. But I become very skeptical about it because the mindset of the tourists there, once they got into the resort, they tend to not, don't want to see the dark side of the tourism, like the yeah. environmental, um, those kind of problems. Yeah. And the spending patterns they do, like the honeymooners or the long vacation um, travelers, they just spend in it and they don't really, not much care about what they are doing and then the food waste everything is way more than the city the, the properties in cities yeah. so i was um wondering about the also the psychological the pattern changes of a, of the tourist can be changed from the destination to destination i think that affect yeah. to the um the tourism as well yeah, and, and you know, I would say the single you, you raise a very important point. The one of the single biggest challenges for tourism is many people for fifty years, uh, fifty years, fifty weeks of the year, they behave really well. They maybe do really good things. When they go on a leisure vacation, they just switch, and they do stupid things. They behave differently. They don't care. They. They go back home and then they switch back to normality. So the real challenge is how do you get people to change their behavior for the better when they're on leisure vacation? And it is quite interesting here through COVID that the federal government was very generous with um, uh, sort of tax relief and funds to help people through, through the COVID pandemic. One of the positive outcomes for Orlando, but actually it was pretty rough. Far more people, actually, they used their COVID money to come on vacation. And they went crazy, absolutely crazy. Behavior was terrible. They were really making a mess in hotel rooms. 
and you're like, gee, what, like a bunch of animals. And I think it was a combination of what they saw was free money. It was a combination of they'd been shut in their house for six months. And okay, it was a classic case economically, Orlando did very well, but it caused a lot of damage. And it was just, gee, don't people ever think? So it's a huge challenge, it really is. And, and funnily enough, there's a lot of work going on in, at the moment in many parts of the world, and that they're, they're turning it it's through what narrative and storytelling. So it's how can you try and tell the story in a way there's a, that will get people to change their form of behavior. And I was, I've never been to the Maldives, but I know many people have visited and worked there. And in many cases, they have probably the hardest job because you're a long haul destination. So people are spending a lot of money. They're traveling a long way. It's a dream destination. The last thing on their mind when they get there is to save the planet. When in reality, that's exactly what they should be thinking of because the Maldives will vanish. So <laughs> it's very, very extreme. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult one because in some ways, Florida has it easier because 90% of its visitation are domestic. So it's easier to get the message across to domestic visitors. It's much harder when it's the long haul, quite arrogant markets, to be honest, who have that entitlement and who don't wish to worry about the world's concerns when they're in the Maldives, when in reality, it's making the situation 10 times worse. So no, you, you've got some very, very severe challenges in the Maldives and similar places around the world. Okay, I want to go Maldives before they're disappearing from us. Ah, but then you're making it worse, you see. This is the, this is the challenge. So, and, and again, unfortunately, this is what happens. So you get the bucket list scenario yes. where people just want to go even more before it vanishes. It's, well, well, actually, if you change your behavior, then it may not actually vanish. So it's the, it's the catch-22. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, so what is the my question is actually related to the conversation we just had. So um, I think sustainability and tourism are incompatible, to be honest. And in fact, I'm quite skeptical about these sustainable actions, so sort of like impacts, because no matter what we do, they visit because they want to visit. And um, when where there is a people, there is a pollution. So I think it has to be a little bit mandatory or even though if there is a even though if they are they are the tourist, it, it has to be mandatory at some point. So what do you think about this? Yeah. I uh, it, yeah, I don't agree with you fully, but it goes back to my point about population. So we talk about lots of things, but actually the population will increase by about two billion people in the next 30 years. It's like wow. So where, where's everybody's gonna where, where's everybody gonna go? What are they gonna do? What are they gonna live off? Okay. So I take a slightly more pragmatic view because I don't believe you can't stop tourism. You can't fund you can't fundamentally stop it. When you've got that amount of people, they're going to do something. So you have to meet, you have to manage it in as best way as you possibly can mm. to preserve it, sustain it. Um but recognizing that nothing's perfect, but it can be a lot, lot better than it is at the moment. Yeah. And, and I, I would argue you, you have to be careful because if you're asking about development, well, we certainly wouldn't be sitting here looking at a computer screen. We, we just wouldn't. So most industries have a negative. Uh, tourism can be a lot, lot better. And I guess that's what keeps us driving because you accept tourism is never going to go away. It's never going to stop, but it right. can be done a lot. It can be done a lot better. Yes. Anyway, we are regulation, law and policy we need for mm -hmm. managing and sustainably for human beings. And I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. And we never have stop a, time. OK, we have a three minutes. I'm. I want to give three minutes for you, uh, whatever you want to address from us. 
Ellen. Me? Okay. Uh, I, I would say, uh, actually, the last question was a good one. Um, I, I would say stay, re really understand what tourism is all about uh, and be positive and just manage it in a more proactive manner. Good. And I think it's a, and funny enough, I, I go back to France. I, most of my vacations are in France. So despite living in Florida, we go back to France. But my wife's in Epinal in the Vosges, Elisa, so Eastern France. Uh, you know, it's quite poor. It's very rural, but it's fantastic. Yes. And a lot of the things that we took, France actually does a lot of these things quite well but they don't showcase it. And, uh, and part of it is because the way France is structured, it's very well managed at the local and the regional level. So mm -hmm. it the, the way the country is structured works quite well for tourism. France's biggest problem is seasonality is a nightmare because everybody goes on vacation at the same time, which is a really stupid idea. But well, it's it, a great it, idea. <laughs> it's, it's deeply <laughs> cultural. It's deeply cultural. But no, I would say understand tourism properly be proactive and, and don't give up yes many elements are unsustainable but it's our job to make to make that better that's okay. that's that's what drives us yeah. i like a uh, france the the equality okay it's my, it's my favorite country <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much alan uh phil um Okay, th thank you very much for listening, everybody. And, and Chulmu, in the morning, in my morning, I will send you a PDF of the slides so you, sure, can, you sure. can take it later, everybody. Okay, we have a very good uh, the smart tourism education department and program. So this is a huge chance to us to communicate with all over the world, uh, well known professor like you. It's very thankful to uh, us. Okay. Well, th thank you very we much indeed, to see everybody. You face to face, sooner or later. Oh, I wish. Okay, I'm going to go to bed now. <laughs> okay. Sure. Good night. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. bye. Thank, thank you very much. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.